This is the Monday, August 30th, 2021 meeting of the Northampton Historical Commission. <clears throat> Pursuant to the governor's act of, of extending the COVID-19 measures um, adopted during the state of emergency, the meeting will be held using remote participation and it is being recorded. Um, we always begin these meetings with public comment. And um, what we'd like to do tonight, I know there are a number of you who may be here to talk about the property on Warner. Um, we are going to be deliberating about that issue later on in the agenda, but we are going to be taking public comment on it now because this is uh, our deliberations are not a public hearing. So we would prefer to take those um, comments now. So if anybody has any comments, they're welcome to um, to identify themselves and their address. Yes, uh, my name is Fred Zimnock and I live in the Ward 3 Historic District. I'd like to say that the St. John Cantius Church was deemed a worthy of a one-year demo delay in the Historic Commission review of properties by Health and Drake dated July 20th 2005. Uh, recent events show this conclusion was correct. Uh, I cannot stay for this meeting until the end. I'll have to leave quickly, but would like to remind the commission that yesterday was the 235th day uh, anniversary of the day that the former Revolutionary War veteran Captain Luke Day of West Springfield led a group of farmers, veterans, and town folks from Goodman's Ferry on the bank of the Connecticut River down Bridge Street. They carried muskets and ax handles on their shoulder. They marched to fife and drum and were determined to prevent the jurists now being at Clark's Tavern from holding their quarterly session of the Court of Common Pleas here in our town. I'm sure you know the rest of the details. I look forward to viewing the open media recording of this historic commission meeting on Facebook and any information about the coming preservation plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Thanks. Always appreciate your comments. Anybody else? Ryan, it looks like you have your hand up. Very briefly, Ryan O'Hara of 76 Pleasant Street. I'm not here on myself, though. I'm here on behalf of New Way Homes uh, and John Hanzel as attorney for New Way Homes. We have submitted a letter to the commission requesting that they consider whether under the demolition delay ordinance to remove the property at 61 Warner from the one year delay that had been issued two months early, essentially. Uh, and I'd briefly just like to comment on the basis for that request. I know we spelled it out in the letter, uh, but that ordinance provision does provide that the commission can set aside a demo delay when either it feels the purpose of the delay has been satisfied, there's no feasible, uh, there's no feasible preservation of the property, or if there's a compelling benefit to the city that would come in lieu of the delay. Here, we feel this property satisfies all three of those requirements when it only needs to satisfy one for the commission to lift the delay. This property is a single family home. It's severely dilapidated. And in the 10 months since this delay was issued, no entity whatsoever has come forward with any sort of feasible plan for preservation, which is the whole purpose of this delay. Now, I know the board received some letters in advance of, excuse me, the commission in advance of the hearing tonight and may well hear some commentary along those same lines. But what those letters speak to is the neighborhood and certain individuals, I should say, within the neighborhood's overwhelming opposition to my client and his projects. But what it doesn't speak at all to is some preferable preservation goal of this property. And that's because frankly, in the 10 months that have elapsed, it's become clear there is none. While these individuals claim that there's some other use of this property to be preserved, None have developed plans or presented them to my client to that effect. My client himself in these 10 months has considered whether there's some other route for these properties. There really is none. This house could not be renovated at any sort of cost that would make it possible to, to sell and use as a single family home. And it has no other real function as a structure. And then beyond that, there is a clear and compelling benefit to the city 
that would come from proceeding with the demolition now. That would get three new houses, all of which are standing prepared for construction to proceed into the housing stock here. The two months that remain on this demolition delay aren't going to do anything other than serve a punitive purpose of somebody seeking to turn one single family home piece of housing stock into three and to delay construction into the winter. It's our position that this structure has no feasible preservation objective, that that has been explored, that those who asked for this delay in the first place haven't in good faith sought to establish what purpose it might be preserved for. And instead, there's just this punitive attempt to delay this as long as possible. At this point, the economic benefit in having the three homes that would be permitted is clear, and we'd ask the commission to lift the uh, delay. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Is there anybody else? Deborah? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Could you please identify? Yeah. 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 My name is Deborah Berkovitz. I live at um, 41 Warner Street. Thank you for your service to members of the Historical Commission. I would like to specifically rebut the points that Mr. O'Hara has made. The existing home, he said, which has been in severe disrepair for some time, cannot be renovated for sale and use as the cost involved to bring the property into code compliance and in line with modern standards and consumer expectations would far exceed the price that buyers would pay on the open market. The house was lived in by a family right up until the time that Mr. Hensel bought it. So disrepair is a, is a vague term. Um, it is likely in a greater state of disrepair than when purchased since the windows, since the windows at both this property and at Landy Ave also slated for demolition by Mr. Hensel were intentionally left open for weeks on end. And as I watched this at both houses, I wondered if it was to bolster the argument that the houses were not salvageable. Modern standards and consumer expectations are completely variable. Someone who wants to buy one of Mr. Hensel's cookie cutter houses for $750,000 or $850,000 is not the person who wants to live in a house like 61 Warner. The standards and expectations are very different. You couldn't pay me to live in a new way home, much as Mr. Hensel probably couldn't tolerate my low pitched bedroom ceilings and full bathroom off the kitchen in a dirt basement. When 61 Warner was on the market, I made an offer on it for it to be my own residence or it could have been an investment property for me. Either way, the numbers work just fine. My expectations on an investment property isn't in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. It is to cover an hourly wage, so in the tens of thousands of dollars. We have different goals. Mine is to preserve houses and neighborhoods. His is not to. Mr. Hensel doesn't have either the skill set or the interest in renovating a 170-year-old house, but others do. They just weren't given the opportunity. Your job isn't to decide on how much profit is enough profit, but if a house should be protected with hopefully a solution in place. No individuals or entities have presented New Way with any proposals or plans for preservation or alternate use. I would like to know all of the means that Mr. Hensel used to solicit proposals and plans. Was the house advertised for sale? Were bids for renovation solicited? I'd like to know. It seems like that's part of the reason for having a demo delay. Um, I actually offered to buy the house from him right at the beginning and I was flatly turned down because he paid 260,000 for it and is selling three houses for more than $2 million. So of course he turned me down. I know someone else who was gonna make an offer on the house, someone for whom getting into the Northampton housing market was a stretch. So they wanted to buy it, move in and slowly fix it up. We do have a shortage of housing stock in Northampton, but it's not for houses priced in the 600 to 900,000 range. So let's not make this out to be altruistic. Allowing for the work at the property to proceed immediately is best for the neighborhood and the city at large, according to Mr. Ryan. Um, I would say I have a long list of uh, challenges, what that means for the neighborhood. And so I ask again, what were the list of efforts made to determine that there's no feasible op um, option for preservation? The compelling economic benefit to the city might be short-term tax revenue, but the combined cost to the city of the climate burden of his houses, the loss of shade trees, the loss of carbon sequestering open space, the demands on the stormwater system, the addition of 30 to 40 cars on the road will be far more economically devastating to the city, not to mention the fraying of the historical fabric and socioeconomic diversity of Bay Street in the city. So I submit that there's no great economic benefit to the city. Uh, the house was absolutely preservable and there were people interested in buying it and he wasn't interested in selling it, nor did he make any efforts as far as I can see to try to find a preservation option for the property. Thank you. Thank you, Zavra. 
So let's see. Um, so Don Hansel's iPad. Right. Say your name. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah. My name is Joe Duclos. I live uh, at 53 Hinckley Street. So the property that's being worked on is uh, eventually going to be three new neighbors of mine. Um, and the house that's right next to it is also up to sale, means I get four new neighbors on my property line. I see no problem in what's going on here. I've watched all the construction. It's well built, well insulated. I mean, these homes are nice. Yes, Northampton's been screaming about affordable housing for 30 some odd years, but the contractor is building to the letter of the law. He's not doing anything wrong. If anybody should be screaming, I think it should be me having four new neighbors out of this deal. Um, <laughs> change is going to happen. There's not much that we can do about it. We should have screamed 35 years ago when they let the building codes up. Well, that's about all I got to say. If anybody's got something to say to me, please do it. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Anybody else? <clears throat> okay, I don't see any hands. So we're going to move on. Um, I wanted to just like, give a very brief uh, chair's report uh, and also pose a question to the members. Um, uh, I, as you all know, I'm the uh, Historical Commission's representative to the Community Preservation Committee, and we um, un un unusually uh, met over the summer to review two expedited applications. Um, and both of them fell into the historic preservation category, so I wanted to just bring you up to date on those. Um, one of them was a project to <clears throat> the documentation for the Hampshire and Hamden, Hamden County Canal. And this is a multi-town effort. A uh, number of towns are putting in money for this. And it's uh, in the initial stages to document um, the existing resources, I think with a long-term goal to uh, create some sort of historical designation. Um, so that the city of Northampton, um, at our recommendation, we hope, will be uh, supporting this project. And then the second uh, application, I think, believe that some of you who are present reviewed this. Um, it was from the Michelson Galleries, which are located at 132 Main Street. Um, they have a historic building, it used to be the Northampton Institute for Savings, am I saying that right? And um, part of their facade is falling apart. Uh, so they had come to the Community Preservation Committee for a sizable grant to uh, replace or should just say the repair the, the masonry on the facade. Now, this is a very interesting conversation because this is a private, um, not it's a private for-profit business. And we, the commission has not been involved in even receiving applications from private entities, except for maybe one in the past. Um, so we had a very long discussion about whether this is something that we um, felt we should you know, move on. Um, given that, you know, this building is historically significant in the downtown, um, of course, we support its preservation, but um, it is really crossing into a different territory when you start to entertain proposals from private en enterprises, in this case, a business. Um, so what we decided to do was to kind of table it, and we asked um, Michelson's Galleries to come back with a full application in the fall so we could look at it in relationship to uh, the full slate of applications we'll be getting in September. So I just wanted to apprise you of that. Um, it's an interesting dilemma, you know, whether public money of this type and this amount should be given to a private, uh, a private, in this case, business. Um, so any thoughts you have on that would be interesting to hear if anybody has any have you, Martha, have you developed a, a point of view on that issue? Uh, personally or the commission, the committee? Personally, um, it, it's in the works, I think. And I, I would also, I think, um, be interested to hear what the commission members say about this. I 
Um, obviously, the historical commission is not, that's not our job to decide, you know, whether applications are eligible for community preservation funds or not, but I'd be interested to hear um, anyone's point of view, you know, whether so, that's so you don't, you don't have a point of view right now. You know, it's a mix, I have very mixed uh, feelings about it. <clears throat> yeah, I live in the historic, the local historic district in Northampton, and there are a lot of very old houses here that need a lot of work done on them. Um, so as one of the members of our committee said, you know, this sort of opens up the possibility for anyone who owns a historic building in Northampton to come to the CPC for money. Yeah. Um, you know, and there are a lot of old houses, old buildings in Northampton. So. Okay. Thank you. Anybody want to? But I think I, this is okay. Barbara. I yeah, hi, Barbara. It might be possible to, to just think about it and you know make a distinction between a private house that might be quite historic mm -hmm. and the you know a character defining building of downtown which is one more visible and it's part of the fabric of downtown I, and i know it's it's a impossible it's a very difficult decision because you know there're lots of you know owners of downtown properties that could again come to you not just houses but um you know, of buildings downtown and, um, you know, how do you make the distinction of which ones are deserving and which ones aren't, mm -hmm. but um, it's, uh, it, it seems to me that the case could be made for at least um, a partial support so that it would encourage the property owner to do this and make it maybe possibly more affordable. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, friends, I know that I can't remember whether it was Rich or Michael Center or Paul Gala had said at our meeting that you know that they, they they there were less expensive options, but it would basically mean removing that facade and just putting I think it was flat stone up there, or flat some material. Mm -hmm. So it is a loss, but again, I you know I don't envy you having to make the decision whether or not a private um, owner of you know. Of a, gets support from the CPC. Yeah, that's those are all really good points, Barbara. And, you know, we sort of had began talking about that a little bit. I mean, one thing that, you know, would be a possibility, and we're going to talk about the preservation planning effort later in the meeting, um, to look at the possibility long term of um, some time of a revolving loan fund, because what we were really being asked to do is to loan this private organization money, private entity, actually not loan it, get, you know, grant a private organization money. Um, who could then turn around and sell the building and then you know what what where goes the present the city's investment so it was a it's a very complicated um situation and i think if members are interested we could certainly put this on the agenda for more discussion um we'll be meeting the cpc will be meeting probably late september sarah late september i think Again, I don't have my calendar in front of me. October 1st is the oh, first meeting. Yeah, September. so we could talk about this at the September meeting if people are interested in thinking a little bit about it. And um, I'd be happy to share what the commission as a group, you know, uh, deliberated on. That'd be great. Okay. I just also wanted to mention, so I don't forget before the end of the meeting, we are meeting remotely and... Um, there, I believe there is an option for us to meet um, live if we want to. Um, and I wanted to get a sense from commission members how they um, view that. And I would say, and Sarah and I discussed it, if there's even one of us who's not comfortable meeting in person, then we'll continue the remote. Does anybody have a feeling about that one way or another? I'm somewhat uncomfortable meeting. Okay. I think we should continue remote, but revisit the issue ev almost every month. Anybody else? I think I'd prefer to stay on Zoom as well. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. We will, um, we will then for September anyway, we will meet remotely and continue to do so if need be in the future. Uh, we do not have any minutes tonight. So that um, will be not discussed on the agenda. So the next item is um, the request to end the demolition delay period on the properly preserved structure at 61 Warner Street. 
And um, I believe all of you are aware of this. I think Steve, you're probably the one commissioner that wasn't in on all of these uh, discussions that we had several months ago. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody before we talk about this, that um, we had voted back in October to um, properly preserve this structure and put a one-year delay on, on demolition. And um, in front of us is the request to lift that delay a couple months early. Um, this is something that we have not typically done. I'll talk about that in a second. But provided that there's interest in lifting, lifting, lifting the delay, <clears throat> I want to just review with you um, what we need to we would need to find as a commission, and that would be that the intent and the purpose of this, the chapter, which is the demolition delay, is served. So it's been served within ten months, or in the judgment of the commission, there is no feasible option for preservation, or when the commission finds there is a clear and compelling economic benefit to the city which is greater than the benefits of preserving the structure. Um, this, is, this is all, we'll be, all we are reviewing. We don't have the ability to review you know, proposals for new development, anything related to the um, approval not required situation. This is a simple um, situation that is in front of us. And I just did want to say that um, uh, Sarah and I reviewed this earlier, and I, this is my memory, um, We've only had this situation come before us one other time. It was in the case of Smith College that was proposing to uh, demolish a, a building on Paradise Road. And we had asked Smith at the beginning of the demolition delay to really pursue a lot of different options, such as finding someone to um, move it. Um, and um, they looked at all, they really put a concerted effort in to find as many options or pursue as many options as, as they could. And in the end, um, really came up short, but they did agree to fully document the building for us, which is something we often require with a demolition. So um, that said, does anybody have any questions before we deliberate about this? Am I allowed to ask a question just about the, just about the date? Yes, um, I, I'm assuming that's correct. It was in the Bacon, Bacon Wilson letter of October 24th. It was December, that correct, Sarah. It was December 21st. The hearing. I, I don't know when the delay. It was. goes back to the application for demolition yeah. date. Yeah. And can can I ask a question? Of also? course. Yeah, because I mean, we haven't. I don't know whether normally we would have been, but we certainly haven't been advised about what. Um, uh, Mr. Hansel might have done to try and um, get other proposals or other people interested. Um, so I would like to know whether he really seriously did um, consider other options, because I know he went ahead and he was allowed to apply for other applications for other parts of the parcel and for other um, site plans and things like that. But I'm concerned by what um, uh, Deborah, I'm sorry, I can't remember your last name, Ber Berkowitz? Berkowitz. Berkowitz. Deborah Berkowitz said about that that some people did offer to buy it. And, you know, obviously he's under no obligation to accept other offers, but it seems like there was interest from people to preserve the home, either by doing it slowly and just living in it and not buying it to turn it over um, and sell it again. And I'm just... Um, concerned by the lack of um, real effort to find another solution other than demolishing it. Okay. I think that's a valid question, Barbara. And uh, Mr. Hansel, you are here tonight, correct? Yes, I am. Okay. Would you care to respond to that? Uh, first off, that Berkowitz never offered to buy this piece of property. She offered to buy Landy Avenue for me. So it was nothing to do with this property whatsoever. And if she can dispute that, please do so. Um, there was nothing, there was no interest in the house whatsoever. I asked, I asked a couple of people I know if they wanted to move it. No one had any interest in it whatsoever. Okay, so that's that's the, the short of it. Maybe well, the long of it. Okay. <laughs> I can give 
a long version, but I mean, it's just, just, you know, being, I guess, I don't think you want to be three hour meeting. So I'm just trying to. I got a comment on that. So. Yeah. That's... <clears throat> Okay. Does any do any commissioners have questions about it? First, about what we're doing, and second, about the property itself and the process that was gone that has was um, followed to get to this point. I guess okay. I'm interested in in further response to, to Deborah's points in her letter or in her statement. Um, so, Jonathan, are you asking Deborah to clarify, or would you ask for, you asking for more more response from Mr. Hansel? I guess I'm asking her to respond to him if she's comfortable doing that. I will, and uh, I did want to purchase the the property for the same price that he had paid for it, and he was not interested in it. I wanted to move there; it's two doors away from me, and it has two additions, and it's bigger than my house. And I also asked him about Landy Ave. And he said no to both. I didn't know his plans at the time. I thought he was just somebody buying. I didn't know him. So I just knew he bought the house and I thought, you know, and I wish I would have offered a lot more money than I had, you know, if I had known what was going to happen. But it's, it's uh, moving that house is probably not structurally viable, but finding somebody to purchase it would have been viable. Is your office still on the table? Well, it depends if he's going to be building a second house on the other side. I mean, you know, I, I don't, he, he got, he now got plans to tear the house down and have three lots. So am I personally interested? I'm, I'm not personally interested in living there at this point. Uh, if he's not going to be building on the other side of it, I would still be interested. Thank you. Anybody else? Craig, do you have any thoughts about it? Um, no, I just think we should let it time out. John's got other houses he's already scraped off. He can build in other places. I think this one deserves its year long time. I just like to say that <laughs> the firm that's never made an offer on this property to me once, where she's come from this rank is a blatant fly and uh, this is what some people will stoop down to landy avenue yes she did make an offer on it but never on 61 water street okay so john and deborah you've registered your um your perspectives on this i think we understand that thank you steve do you have any thoughts i know this is a new one for you but yeah, um, I'm hesitant to weigh in because I think uh, the city council has not yet formally approved um, my joining the commission. Um, oh, so, I'm yeah. sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. so I don't want to speak out of turn until that. You're certainly, you're, certainly, <laughs> this is um, you're able to ask questions if you have any, or have you have any thoughts? I'm I'm taking notes and following as we're as we're going along. So okay. Um, and okay. if if that appointment happens before the next one, I'm happy to um, offer some perspective at that point in time. Okay, fair enough. Harvey. I, I don't have a strong opinion. I, I guess my impulse at this moment is to follow Craig and just let mm -hmm. me time out, but I, I don't really know what to think, frankly. Okay. And Barbara, you've asked questions. Do you have any other follow-up thoughts about I, it? I mean, I, I would, I, I believe I agree with Craig too. I was leaning towards um, just not, not lifting the demo um, early, but I, it is unfortunate that, I mean, not just in Northampton, but all over the country, that demolition delay or review ordinances rare, rarely actually prevent mm -hmm. a um, demolition. Sometimes they do, and it's happened even a couple of times here in Northampton, but, um, uh, I still feel like we have to make an effort when it's when we feel it's important, both for a particular structure and for the character of a neighborhood to try and um, preserve a building. But I am I was also concerned by and you know I can't remember whether it was Deborah's letter or the other letter we got because we did get two letters mm -hmm. um, about 
well, first of all, I was confused about the zoning issues and I know we're not concerned with what goes there afterwards, but I was confused by that, whether these lots are, well, legal, I think was the term that somebody was saying they didn't feel the lots were legal and also about um, safe removal of hazardous materials, um, which is a very important issue. And um, I wonder if as commissioners, we can ask the, um, I don't know whether who it would be the building commissioner or what, what department it would be to really double check these things and do due do, do diligence to make sure that this is really being done properly. Okay, great, Barbara. I'm glad you brought those up. So, Sarah, would you mind um, explaining the ANR and the particulars of that in this situation so everyone understands what's legal? Please. Sure. Uh, so, an approval not required plan, which is a unique quirk to Massachusetts, uh, only demonstrates that uh, a proposed lot division has adequate frontage on a public street. That's all it shows. It doesn't indicate whether a lot is, is buildable or whether it, it meets septic or, or other requirements. And the planning board doesn't have any latitude to not consider or to disapprove an, an ANR plan that does show adequate frontage. Um, and regarding the house still being there when permits were applied for, that's pretty standard. Um, generally, when, when permits are applied for, the, the previous structures on a lot will, will remain there until all due diligence and permits have been obtained. So that, that's not unusual in any way. Thank you. And regarding hazardous materials, I talked to Sarah about this. We talked about this this afternoon. And um, my assumption, and I think Sarah, you weren't 100% sure about this, is that um, to obtain a building permit, I would imagine because of um, environmental regulations and the building code that uh, there would have to be some sort of um, uh, threshold for how these are removed, and that would be part of the approval for the permit process. But we don't know. I don't. We don't. Sarah didn't know that, and I don't know that. So that would be something that we certainly could convey. I believe it could be a condition of our vote, or um, we could take a separate vote on it, or we could convey that to the building commissioner. Um, because that certainly is a very valid concern. Um, okay, Barbara, do you have any more? Does that help at all? Um, yes, yeah, I think that's, okay. that's good for now. Thank you. All right. Well, I think if nobody has um, additional questions or comments, and it sounds like you're pretty um, resolved about it, I think we can, I could entertain a motion for this. We could vote. So would someone like to offer a motion? I'd like to, if I may, I'd like to second Craig's motion, but I'd like him to, to word it. Craig? I, I propose that we keep the, the one year delay in effect. I haven't been convinced tonight that we need to move, remove this. I believe we should just let it stay as it is. Seconded. Okay. Any other discussion? All right. Sarah, I think we're ready to vote. All right. Um, Martha? Yes. Craig? <laughs> we can't Craig? see you, Craig, so you know. Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, Barbara? Yes. Harvey? Yes. And Jonathan? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the motion is passed. Thank you everyone for coming and clarifying and offering your opinions are always welcome as you know. Thank you for your consideration. All right, uh, the next one on the agenda is a proposal from Northampton, Historic Northampton for a CPA request or support, excuse me. And um, they have, um, Ask that this be delayed, they need to do a little bit more work. So we're going to be looking at this um, at the end of um, September. So with that, um, we will move on to um, the next item, which is goal setting with planning and sustainability in the preservation plan. And I believe we have a less, our illustrious planning director here. He was. 
There he is. <laughs> I was looking for the name, Wayne. All I saw there, there's your face. Um, so welcome. We're so pleased to have you here. We don't often get to see you. <laughs> um, would you like to? Would you like to uh, take over? Sure. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, thanks for having me. So this really is just sort of opening up this this discussion. I don't have a detailed agenda. It's really sort of to start brainstorming with you all. So I just want to give some quick background on, on where we're going. So most of you know that Sustainable Northampton is our the city's comprehensive plan. It's really the blueprint for a lot of what this office does and increasingly for other departments as well. So we have sort of a four-step process that we've been working on. And I want to talk about the step that involves you all, but just in terms of the overall context. So the original Sustainable Independent Plan was adopted almost 11 years ago. It's been amended, I think, four or five times. Most recently, earlier this year, when we adopted the Climate Resiliency and Regeneration Plan. Um, so that's our most recent document. Where that's sort of the background. Where and, and you know, resilience and regeneration renews a lot of the pledges we made 11 years ago and obviously much stronger focus on climate adaptation than we had 11 years ago, but not dramatically different in terms of big picture. So a lot of these plans were sort of adopted in different documents, some in portrait mode and some in landscape mode, and they're hard to read together and collectively they're hundreds of pages and some people get confused. So we're currently going through a non-substantive change where we've hired an, an InDesign expert. All these plans were done in InDesign to merge the plans together, get rid of the duplicates. Um, we expect to do that by the end of this calendar year. The idea is to make the plan a lot easier to read. We'll be posting soon sort of redline version of all the current plans that we're dropping things from and how they all fit together. So we, do, we think it's non-substantive. The only thing of anything new is updating our acknowledgements of Native Americans who came before us, which is in the resiliency plan and not in the other documents, but otherwise it's basically cut. Mm -hmm. Once that plan is done, the next big thing is the preservation plan or you know, cultural and historic plan. And I want to, that's the subject of tonight's conversation. I, but just so you jump, so you know we jump ahead. We already, so we're funding for that, thanks to your help, and Martha gets help, gets credit twice on both CPA and, and on Historic Commission. Um, we already have funding for the next step after that, which is sort of opening up sustainable in Hampton. You know, it's been 11 years, it'll be 13 years by the time we get there to think about a total revision for doing it. So there's some things that are going to be, you know, they've changed in 11 years in the city. We want to get there, but we think it's important to finish this, the cultural historic plan first. So the reason I am giving you so much background is the cultural historic plan is really about what are the critically important cultural and historic resources we want to save. They're not about, you know, there's a sort of debate, I think, for the heart and soul of the community for where should development go and where should development not go. That's a broader conversation that we want to do for opening the whole plan. Um, I, I'm trying to avoid the cultural and historic being sort of a, a surrogate for city development. It's certainly gonna include the, a couple of things. I mean, now that you've closed the last meeting, I can talk about the demolition delay. As Barbara noted, demolition delay is a pretty weak tool. Um, and it's a weak everywhere. It's not unique to Northampton. It's just, you know, the only real thing is if someone's so desperate to use their property that they don't want to wait a year, maybe they'll look for other opportunities and on the margins that can help, but it's not dramatic. You know, so one of the clear conversations is, should we have more historic districts? Martha said, you know, that she lives in a historic district and that district we've had in the books for a long time was expanded. I lose track of time, four or five years ago to add Roundhouse at Round Hill. Um, and then we have, a, we have some local historic districts. Fred talked about the one in his neighborhood, but local, I mean, I'm sorry, national historic districts. But federal historic districts, frankly, are mostly feel good items. They're only important when you're spending federal funds or getting federal permits. So a bank 
that wants to tear down an amazing building on Pomeroy Terrace has to go through, because they're federally chartered, has to go through historic districts, but it doesn't mean that much elsewhere. So that's the kind of thing that could be really useful, right? You know, should we be preserving historic landscapes? That hasn't been a lot of conversation. We have some in our open space plan that think not just about buildings, but about landscapes. Where should historic districts be? Um, we have not had, except for downtown, what's called a landmark ordinance. We talk about districts. So landmark ordinance was the older approach, right? Brooklyn Bridge is an amazing bridge. The Academy of Music is an amazing building. We've tended to have historic districts that create a comprehensive story to the area where buildings occur. But that's not to say there's not a few gems in the city that, you know, trying to think of an example, the West Farms Chapel and, and school, right? It's not gonna be historic district, but maybe that one building should be a landmark. And again, I'm not trying to judge any, but those to me are the questions we wanna ask going forward. Um, and so I, I'm gonna pause and now it's sort of your time. We'll be doing a detailed scope of services for this. I am welcome, I'm happy to work with the entire historic commission or a subset of the commission, whatever your pleasure is. But I think this sort of initial scoping, what do we wanna be when we grow up? That's important for you all to weigh in. So I hope I didn't prejudice you in my own perspective, but so let me just stop and say, you know, when you all voted to support this and ask for money from CPA, what was it that you all hoped to accomplish? Uh, well, I can start. Um, I know Steve is gonna to wanna to weigh in on this because he has a lot of experience with this um, kind of work. Um, you know, I just, I work all over Massachusetts and beyond and these communities and the, the preservation issues they're dealing with are so, um, they're so complicated beyond the standard mass historical commission, you know, um, inventorying your historic buildings, you know, getting them on the national register, which I'm not discounting at all, but I just, um, you know, I'm working in towns where they have hundreds of teardowns a year and they're just, their historic neighborhoods are getting really um, altered. Um, there's a lot of, you know, small housing that was built after the war or even before that's getting torn down and replaced by enormous structures. And older people who want to downsize and stay in the community have a hard time, you know, finding places to live. I mean, so it, it feels like it's a very, um, it's just become a lot more complicated, I think. <laughs> was when the preservation, National Preservation Act was passed in the 60s. Um, you know, it's really intertwined, I think, with a lot of other um, issues about, you know, housing and environment um, that we're facing on, on all fronts in planning. So that's, you know, and then it, just to follow up with that, I think that I would really would like to see um, the prep plan explore the gamut of tools that are available to us. Um, because I think those, a lot of times those are not really used very well. And I think they could be. And well, you know, one example is this, um, is the Michelson Gallery, you know, okay, I, I don't think a revolving loan fund would cover $175,000 of a building repair, but you know, there may be smaller um, facade improvements that a, a, a historic preservation loan fund could help, you know, support. Um, so that's a bad case. It, we sh I shouldn't bring that case into this because I think it has its own, you know, complications. So I think it's a good point. I mean, you know, Savannah, Georgia is one of the communities that has the most success with demolition delay, you know, particularly before they had a, a comprehensive um, historic district. But part of the reason it was credited is there was private funding, it was in the city, who would help buy those properties. So if I'm a developer and I have to delay and not tear down a building, and there's a trust who's going to buy it from me, mm -hmm. maybe that gets me over. But without mm -hmm. that funding, we can't go anywhere. So absolutely. Um, yeah. Or, oh, Barbara, go ahead. One, one thing I wanted to say was when, when we started talking about coming up with a new preservation plan or a comprehensive one, because um, it's been a lot longer than, what did you say, 11 years, Wayne, of, for the sustainable Northampton. It's been a lot longer that, since Northampton's had a real 
historic preservation plan. And I think one of our aims was we really wanted to figure out a way that we could be more proactive, identifying, again, buildings, landscapes, issues that we wanted addressed and, and preserved instead of just being reactive, because most of the time we react to a demolition delay that comes before us, as opposed to identifying something that we might try and encourage before it becomes a, um, a demolition um, request. Um, sorry, there was one other thing I was going to say. Oh, and it, it's funny that because, Martha, your idea for maybe a loan program is that um, my husband, Joe, who many of you know, has been bugging me for years to say, well, identify that a historical commission should identify a building downtown, say that it would be really great to restore the historic windows instead of like up on the side. We actually have a building on the second floor, which we didn't do, but there's like a, a, a window that goes all the way across that really is not so great to just encourage uh, landlord uh, building owners to improve uh, buildings by again, having, in that case, it would be grants, but loans. But I like this idea of um, particularly for really necessary repairs and not necessarily aesthetics um, to, re to restore something to what it used to look like. I, I like that idea very much of trying to figure out a way of funding that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Steve, do you have any thoughts? My immediate thought is that these are all great ideas. These are all things that we um, should be talking about. So I was scribbling down a few things. Um, I think an individual, the ability to designate an individual landmark would be really smart here. Um, there are a few Massachusetts municipalities that can do that and others use the local historic district process to sometimes designate one property, but I think that's awkward and kind of clunky and it's hard for most members of the public to understand why you would call it a district if it's just one property. I think there's something that's very elegant about saying we recognize this singular building as a landmark in our community. It fits with the way we talk about a visual landmark. So um, I think that meets a lot of goals. Um, that might involve some uh, legal changes to the ordinance or some research. So one question would be to what extent is the consultant able to engage in that kind of um, legal work? Um, a second is that I totally agree with Barbara's comment about being proactive. And I think one part of that is survey, but a, a related part of that is context. So what are the major contexts for analysis? So what are we looking for? What are we thinking about? What are the periods of development? So you know, you might think about what are major stages of development. Certainly as I look at Northampton, I see a lot of late 19th century and early 20th century buildings, um, both industrial and commercial, um, but we have different residential contexts. So having that at the ready, even if that's just a paragraph or a two page thing, something like that can work together in concert with um, survey work and can provide helpful information to the commission when making decisions. Um, and I certainly think that an LGBTQ context is urgently needed. It's certainly one of the things that makes Northampton distinctive. And now we have more than 50 years gay and lesbian history. So, um, and there may be others that just, they don't even appear in past plans and they're not even something that's um, considered in terms of social history or community history. Um, and, you, and there are many examples around the country of places that have done that kind of work. I agree that incentives are really important. You can't just wield the stick, you have to have a carrot. So whether that's um, trying to encourage a revolving loan fund, and maybe that's regional, or maybe there's a way to work with other towns on that, but something like that. And other incentives too, I think really important. Um, communication, I think an overall goal should be, it should be easy for the public to understand what's going on. If people wanna look up a property and find out if it's historic, um, that that's available and the form B process is a little clunky um, for that. And then last, I think, you know, we should set forth a vision and a big vision, you know, because there's a lot of challenges and really interesting debates going on now about sustainability and green architecture and preservation and where they come together, where they're in concert and where they're in conflict. And I think the plan should say something about that, especially if the comprehensive plan for the whole city is called Sustainable Northampton, right? So how do we, as the Historical Commission, how do people in the community who are passionate about uh, heritage, about preservation, think about how those, those two things might come together, right? Um, 
And that could be very specific things like design guidelines. Do you want to allow solar panels or other changes on historic properties? But it could also be broader in terms of thinking about adaptive reuse and the benefits of um, encouraging use of historic properties. So that seems like one overarching issue. Um, and I'll stop there, but this is really exciting. I mean, I think it's like, it's, it's uh, a plan can kind of do a lot of things to bring the community together. Sometimes it might highlight where people disagree, but at least, you know, there's a um, more organized approach to thinking about it. And Northampton just has incredible historic resources. So that's also fun because we get to talk about them with the community too. So let me step back. I'm hearing six boxes we want to explore. Um, from what you've all said. And so I just want to make sure I have that right and if I'm missing things. So the first is, you know, division, what do you want to be when you grow up? And um, so that's one. The second is sort of the context that, that, that Steve added to this conversation. What does this mean? What appears? It's lots of good historic information, but not necessarily tied together to our inventories. The third is, you know, the inventories, whether it's this form B or also doing things like cemeteries and landscapes and other things beyond what we've, we've done. Um, the regulatory tools, and I think this is both sort of the traditional regulatory tools, but also we have our right to invent our own. So you all know demolition delay, we copied other towns, but it, there was no state statute for it. We did central business architecture because we didn't think historic districts fit downtown. So we created our own thing. Um, if we did a landmark ordinance, we could do it underneath that. Um, you, some of you were involved, I think, I can't remember who was on the commission at the time, but we have, because we had a lot of former schools and houses of worship that were surplus. we have a carrot approach to them to say, if you, if you put a historic preservation restriction on one of these former buildings, you can use them for almost anything. Because otherwise, you know, if you have a church in the middle of a residential neighborhood, it, you can't do it for anything other than new house of worship. But if you could do other things, you could do. so we have those tools. But what are the new ones? I just know the ones we've done. Then the the and some of those are regulatory sticks, and some are regulatory incentives, and then financial incentives is my fifth box. And then I think you all implied this, but sort of how do these things all integrate together, right? So that it's not we don't have a historic section or plan that says preserve this, and an economic development section that says tear it down at the same spot. Right, yeah. Um, so am I missing big boxes, first of all? I'm glad you put the, the mission, what we want to be when we grow up. I'm glad you put that first. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the thematic part of it is really important. Like, to Steve, you know, um, mentioned the, you know, gay and lesbian history, but there may be other... I know there are other larger themes that are very much about North what Northampton is about, and it may not be just you know 17th century history. It could be a lot of other things. Um, the arts community is one of them. You know what? How do, how does the arts community community manifest itself in the historic fabric of the town, the city? Um, so that would be another thing I think that kind of in that. And I I think another one of those areas, Martha, might be, you know. What, and in, this might be very important in terms of what landscapes we might recommend or, or identify, yep. um, would be what was here before Northampton was here. Mm -hmm. And really trying to be very sensitive to earlier settlements, um, artifacts or um, you know, evidence of, of other people being here before Northampton was settled, of mm -hmm. indigenous people being yep. here. Because that could really inform on the landscape issue, particularly, I think. Yeah, I think that's really true. Um, anybody else? Uh, Harvey, do you have any thoughts or Craig? We're doing all the talking. And they have nothing intelligent to add. <laughs> I can't believe that. <laughs> How about you, Craig? I think we have a great resource pool available to us. The CPA site managed by Stuart Saginaw. Saginaw has a unbelievably easy to use database of all the CPA funded projects across the Commonwealth and every community searchable by type of project uh, going back in depths of time. And 
And so for us to consider funding private businesses, downtown at least, I'm, I'm sure we're gonna find something to emulate. The fact that we won't have to invent the wheel on this will make it an easier sell. Mm -hmm. I do have a couple of places that used um, CPA dollars to fund smaller grants uh, in projects that were really not as effective as they should have been. So it's kind of unusual to see private buildings getting public dollars. But there's a way to make this last without putting a forever conservation restriction on the building uh, to prevent it resale and flipped to gain the, the uh, public investment towards the private owner would be to put a, a long-term declining sort of like second mortgage on the place that was fronted to the owner. And th that investment would reduce over time. I think an appraiser would have to uh, map out what the investment was and how the payback period shall be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a effective, well thought out way to do this. And I agree that there are buildings downtown that are deficient and it is part of the really iconic infrastructure is downtown Northampton. We don't have to be having this conversation about buildings in local historic districts to be renovated. I like to leave them the deficient ones there to show that they can't be renovated stupidly they only to be renovated thoughtfully mm -hmm. and so good example just leaving them as they are but that's my take on it. okay thank you. thank you so one thing to think about we have a lot of money but it is money goes very fast in this world um and so one place it's useful for me to get input is particularly about the inventory, the field survey did, is it can absorb, you know, every penny of the budget. And so in some ways, everything else is less expensive, but, you know, so some sense of, you know, clearly we need some more inventory data. One of you, and I forgot who it was, specifically said, you know, we, we, we want to be proactive, not reactive. And that means understanding what's special. Um, so clearly inventory data is some, but just some sense of, the mix, you know, big picture thing that people can get excited about, inventory stuff, it's really important to be proactive. Any thoughts about that? I mean, I think the inventory could be a separate, it could be a recommendation of the plan. It's just, it feels like, like you said, Wayne, you have limited resources and, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of buildings and landscapes in the city. And I don't, I don't know how big the inventory is now. We should know that, right? We don't. I don't. Um, Dylan probably knows. So it seems to me, while that is important, I think these other things that we've talked about, um, it seemed to be much more and, and, and are much more exciting. Um, Steve. Um, Wayne, do we have, are there any maps that show um, parts of the city that have never been surveyed? Because it seems like that that might be one place to start. You know, are there a few areas that have never been surveyed that might be likely to yield some information which would be useful for decision making? And then and then a part of that could be a, a first priority. And then, you know, some of the forms I've looked at, some of them are from the 70s and 80s. And as most of you know, like the documentation standards for all forms of designation are completely different than they were um, 30, 40 years ago. Um, but like updating existing forms, that seems like a low priority compared to areas of the city that have never been surveyed. Mm -hmm. So yes, and, and that fits, I'm glad you said that, because that fits what we have. So we did a project, I don't know, two decades ago now to scan all the form Bs. And at the time we mapped them all. So we have every structure in town and which ones we know have some information about, which ones don't. What we didn't do is some of them, someone went through the Gazette in the 1970s. And so the form Bs were basically where they happened to have data. It wasn't like a systematic effort. It's it someone write an article about it. So Elm Street was well represented and West Farms wasn't so well represented. And those, those actually 70s ones are pretty good. And then we had various points where someone walked the street, someone who knew what they were talking about and said, oh, that's must've been built in this era. And there's almost nothing in the form other than 
a picture and a date that we can't distinguish. We just sort of have, we have it or don't have it. But yeah, we will offer a, right. later in September, the 24th or 25th, the Preservation Mass is hosting their, mm -hmm. their annual conference. And there is a, there is a, a section about uh, using a new tool on macros for mapping mapping out logical historic districts is going to be a presentation on that. It might be worthwhile. Okay. Thanks. So for those of you who don't know, Preservation Massachusetts is um, our statewide advocacy organization. It's different from the Mass Historical Commission, which is the state agency um, and the State Historic Preservation Office for Massachusetts. Um, Preservation is an advocacy organization and they, um, I know host an annual conference, among other things. Um, it's usually in the fall and it's virtual this year, right, Craig? Pretty sure it's virtual. And so, um, yeah, you could look on their website and check that out. Um, the, the other thing that I, I'm not sure how you are going to be planning to structure this, Craig, but whether there'll be some kind of a committee set up. I'm, no, I'm sorry, Craig, I'm like Wayne, <laughs> long day. Um, Will there be some kind of a committee set up to work with a consultant? How are you thinking about doing that? So planning boards, the legal agency adopts the comprehensive plan. And mm -hmm. what we've always done is we go to whatever agencies, boards are involved, like for the open space plan, we go to the, you know, Conservation Commission, Recreation Commission, and the planning board. For example, okay. So we certainly would want you all and the planning board at the table. Mm -hmm. um, Typically what we've done in the past is it's sort of a double veto. I mean, typically it wouldn't, it wouldn't pass beyond you all until you're comfortable with it. And then we'll go before the planning board. They may make changes, but we might be involved. For historic commissions, how you do it is up to you. Sometimes we don't have boards want to do it as a committee as a whole and some want to appoint a subcommittee. And I have no opinion about that. That's really up to you all, Frank. For how you do it. And I'll ask the planning board the same thing for how all that they want to do. So you wouldn't have a joint committee that's made up of members from planning and historic? You wouldn't do Usually that? Usually not, because the interests okay. are sort of different. You know, planning board wants the integration. I mean, they want a, a lot of the same thing. You know, the inventory information. I mean, some individual members may care, but they'd be less interested in the inventory information. Mm -hmm. They'd be mm -hmm. more yeah. interested in the vision part, the, the regulatory tools, and the integration. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, you know, we, we've done different things. I mean, obviously in pre-COVID times, we would probably might do a joint meeting at some point, you know, sort of to, to force back the big, the big conversations. Um, we're certainly gonna do a public hearing during this process and that would probably be a joint public hearing. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I was, I, gonna, I was gonna ask Wayne, do you have any view on how the larger community gets involved and stays involved? In, in this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, we certainly want to do engagement. Um, we're required to do a public hearing. Public hearings are not necessarily that, um, are not always that useful. So we often try to do some sort of workshops during the process. Yeah. Which lets people get more involved in the weeds and doing it. The reason that, you know, that, that, you know, I started with this debate about the heart and soul of the community. Right. I, I think doing constructive engagement about what are really special resources and how do we deal with them is easy and will be constructive and fun, right? A lot of planners in my world like doing comprehensive planning because it's away from the day-to-day -day battles with all the same vision. Mm -hmm. If it's really about is development going to occur or not going to occur, that's harder. I mean, the people have very strong feelings about it. That's harder to reach consensus. That's probably more to the discussion on the next stage of the comprehensive plan. So I think we can do really constructive workshops. Um, we would plan them in accordance with, or, you know, in concert with who we hire in the process. So it's not like I have a vision for how those would go um, in, in the process. I think that's really important. I mean, there have been various issues in town in the last year where people have been clamoring for more, for more involvement. And sometimes they've been a royal pain. I, I can see that, <laughs> but uh, I think it's something we have to struggle struggle yeah. with. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and the part that we've been deeply committed to, and I don't know how this shows up for this plan, but is 
we know there are major segments of our community who are rarely engaged in anything. Um, particularly lower income renters are sort of the ones we have the least per lowest percentage. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know the answer. I know that, you know, for our transportation plan, we were lucky we had a $50,000 grant that's just about community outreach. And so that was fabulous. And we did a lot of focus groups. You know, you could use the entire budget just for that, but somehow that has to fit into this. this okay. Um, any other questions? What is your time frame, Wayne? Did you you kind of you know we, we're doing this this the non you know the, the the technical part of the update the plan by the end of the calendar year. So we right. want to focus on this in twenty twenty two, but we can start doing the scope of service. I mean, so the scope of service is hopefully this fall, maybe go out to bid late this fall. So I'd mm -hmm. like to get work started in January. Mm -hmm. um, that would be what's great. Nice about CTA is unlike outside grants, there's no artificial deadlines, so it's going to take how long it takes. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, that's my goal. Anyway. Okay. Um, and again, asking you all how I'm happy to come to any meetings you want. So whether it's a subcommittee or a committee of the whole is totally your call and whatever works for you. Okay, great. Well, that was something that um, we, I mean, we can think, talk about it now, or we could also talk about it in September. Um, if anyone on, on the commission would like to, um, well, whether we want to form a subcommittee or everyone wants to be involved, or um, if we do want to form a subcommittee, are there individuals who would be interested in taking part in that? And you can give it some thought, so we have a little time. But um, And just the warning, I think you all know, but whichever format you do, it's subject to open meeting law. So even subcommittees would still have to post. Right. Right. Yeah, and I, I would just say, you know, um, if anybody is interested in a subcommittee, I, I would just be prepared to um, <laughs> do the work. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, in some ways the hardest work is the upfront work when you hear the scope of service. At that point, we sort of turn it over to the vendor Right. And then we have to check in on them periodically and make sure they're doing the right thing. Yeah. Sure. Presumably that won't be too hard. Okay. Um, great. So Wayne, thank you. That was perfect. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Hope we see you again. Nice. Um, all right. And is there any other business, Sarah? Um, Not for me. Okay. Anybody else have anything that they want to talk about before we adjourn? Oh, right. I'm, an, I'm an enthusiastic adjourner. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. All right. We don't have to vote. We could do a hand yeah. vote, right, Sarah? Yes, that's fine. Well, you can't see me, but I could, uh, I could just say yes since you can't see me. Okay. So um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Seconded. Second. Okay. Discussion, no. All in favor, yes.